Selenexor update, a post hoc analysis of Boston trial data. First of all, you know, uh, to put it in uh, context, uh, uh, this this is a post hoc um, uh, study. That means you know, the study was not designed to answer the dosing question. It was more about the Selenexor is an important drug that needed to be approved and needed in the treatment armamentarium for the treatment of myeloma, because um, Selenexor is the you know um, first uh, of its kind to be approved as a uh, inhibitor of nuclear export. So it has a completely new mechanism of action. And uh, this got an accelerated approval in relapsed refractory myeloma patient. But whenever you have a drug that is approved in an accelerated fashion, the FDA wants to make sure, you know, while they want the drug available for patient as quickly as possible, especially if it is potentially a life-saving drug, but they want to be sure that they are not fooled, that it is truly is beneficial and it is added to the existing drug. So it was a randomized phase three trial called Boston trial that was conducted. And this was uh, Selinexor, uh, Velcade, Dexamethasone versus Velcade and Dexamethasone. As we know that Velcade, Dexamethasone or Botezumab, as it is a uh, generic name is, is uh, approved. So in this randomized clinical trial, it turned out that the patient who got Selinexor in addition to Botezumab, Dexamethasone did better than patients who got Velcade and Dexamethasone alone. So that allowed full approval of Selenexor for patients. Then the next important question that comes to physician is how best to use the drug? And, uh, you know, this drug has some GI side effects and it has some blood count side effects. And the question is, are we able to adjust the dose without losing its efficacy? Or it has a threshold at which if you lower the dose, then the drug is no longer effective. So that's always important because, you know, once the drug is in the market, the physician, treating physician needs to know uh, how to manage the side effects in the patient and what are the flexibility in the dose adjustment. So then what happened in the randomized trial, we looked at only on the arm, which got the three drugs, Selenexor, Botezumab, and Dexamethasone. And as you correctly uh, pointed it out, you know, the patients uh, who were randomized, they started out on Selenexor 100 milligram. You know, that was the study assigned dose. Uh, and the Velcade was once a week, that Selenexone, you know, uh, was once a week, 40 milligram divided in two days. So it was designed to give weekly doses. But because of side effect, the doses were lowered in substantial number of patients. Then the question was, okay, we have patients who everybody started on 100 milligram, but then due to dose adjustment, the dose was reduced in patients. And if it was reduced, was it still effective? And how did the patients fare? So what are the dose reduction that was allowed in the study? So you start with 100 milligram once a week, then you can cut it down to 80 milligram, which is your first reduction then you can cut it down to 60 milligram, that's your dose level two, and then you can cut it down to 40 milligram, that is your dose level three. So this was allowed by uh, protocol. So then we look at the patients, you know, so we found out that they were, uh, you know, uh, substantial, you know, what was the number of patients? There were 207 patients who started on this botezumab, Selenexor and Dexamethasone arm, out of which 69 patients did not require any dose adjustment at all. They stayed on this drug at the full dose of 100 milligram. They tolerated it well. But in two thirds of the patient, 126 patients, the dose was uh, adjusted. When we look at it grossly, there was no difference between the people who got dose reduction and the people who didn't get uh, dose adjusted in terms of major features, amount of myeloma, you know, ISS stage, these uh, cytogenetics or genetic, you know, fish study results, et cetera. So they were not that much uh, different. And then you look at uh, 
how the uh, patients did, how did they respond? That's where we were surprised, as you pointed out, that the patients who had dose adjustment, which was you know two thirds of the patient, actually those two thirds of the patient had an overall response rate which was higher, you know eighty two percent as compared to people who were on flat dose of 100 milligram starting dose and didn't have to have dose adjustment, their response rate was 67%. So the overall response rate was better, but even the depth of response, VGPR, CR, they were all still favored the dose reduction. Then you looked at, okay, what about, okay, the dose response, how long did the disease stay under control? So the patient who had dose adjustment, like you correctly said, once you lower the dose and the, you find out what is the right tolerable dose for the patient and the patient is able to tolerate, they are staying on the drug longer and therefore the disease was controlled for a longer period of rest, you know, longer period of time. So therefore the progression-free survival or duration of response, both of them were improved. So the progression-free survival, as you pointed out, was much improved. So this, as I told you, is a post hoc uh, analysis, you know, and in that we can tell the doctors now, okay, we know Selinexor is an important drug. It has a completely new mechanism of action. It works well in combination in this trial, Velcade dexamethasone versus Velcade Selinexor dexamethasone. The uh, trial arm was better, adding Selinexor was better. And you can adjust the dose of the drug so that the patient can tolerate it well and stay on it better. So I think it was more of a practical benefit to the you know, physicians who are treating the patient. And of course, to the patient care that by dose adjustment, you didn't lose the efficacy. That was an important message. But as I told you, the study was not designed. It's a post hoc analysis. Besides dose reduction, what other ways can you manage side effects? So Selenexor is a you know, first-in-class uh, nuclear export uh, uh, inhibiting drug, and it has some unique side effect, but basically two areas. One is the GI, another one is hematologic. The first and foremost, I have to say, it has no kidney toxicity. You can even give, in, give to dialysis patient. It has no nephrotoxicity. It has no cardiotoxicity. So no nephrotoxicity, so dose you know, can be given, it, patient with renal failure can get the dose. No cardiotoxicity. So we know some drugs have cardiotoxicity. It has no liver toxicity, you know. So it has no organ toxicity is very important. So then the question comes up with what are the two areas where the physicians or oncologists are very comfortable. One is blood count, you know, that you can adjust by the dose. And if you're using in combination, it is a matter of two drugs or three drugs are involved. So you can adjust the dose adjustment. And the most important is the GI side effect, the nausea, uh, you know, and because of nausea and vomiting, which is so far, it has been very unusual in the myeloma field with the other drugs. So nausea, vomiting, whereas in solid tumor, where they use cisplatinum, testicular cancer, and other cancers, they are all used to the nausea, vomiting. But in myeloma, generally, we have not had nausea, vomiting as a major issue. And so this drug has nausea vomiting. So you want to always start with the good anti-emetic drugs for it and give it for 48 hours. So I usually give uh, ondansetron with the dexamethasone, which it works very well with, uh, you know, for 48 to 72 hours round the clock every, you know, eight hours. So that even if they don't have nausea, take it for the first. Most of the side effects are going to be seen within the first month. Then two things happen. One, the body adjusts. Number two, the patient is familiar. So the patient is also able to adjust and the physician is able to adjust the treatment and the dosing. So subsequent uh, effect goes down. Then if in some patient, if it is a bit too high, there are other medications that can be added to ondansetron and dexamethasone. Uh, you know, so these are additional drugs that can be given. Most important is the first cycle, you have to work with the patient bring them in, check their you know, blood counts, but more important, check their electrolytes, make sure they are eating and drinking well. If not, give them IV fluid hydration because people have noted in some patients they are nauseous, then the patient kind of uh, stays home, doesn't eat or drink very well and doesn't want to be bothered. And the family members thinks, well, you know, she has taken the medication, she's lying down, let's not bother her. 
That is the key issue. No, no, no. Please make sure she takes her fluids, she takes her meals. If not, take her to the doctor and get IV fluids. That's important. Don't leave the patient with the mantra, don't bother her because let her be or let him be. You know, he's going through the treatment. Let's not bother him. No, no, that's important. First 48 hours after taking the drug, you want to make sure the patient is able to keep things down and is hydrated and is able to maintain the nutrition. If that is done, I think uh, this is a um, important drug and that's what is important for them. When should anti-emetic medications be started? You start, give them the nausea medications up front. Then if they don't have nausea, you know, after the first cycle, if they don't have nausea, then you can take it out. You know, and I told you, you have to give it round the clock for 48 to 72 hours. Then you can always cut down, well, let's give it to 48 hours. And maybe the second day you can see how it is. Then you can bring it down. But please always take the medication with nausea medication. It is better to mitigate it upfront so that your tolerance is better. And therefore, the efficacy of the drug is there because at the end of the day, we are swallowing or taking all the infusions or whatever with one goal in our mind, get the cancer down. Does Selenexor affect sodium levels? The whole idea of the sodium being lower is that, you know, when the patient is nauseous, you know, and they are not eating well, then, you know, when we talk about take hydration, then what happens is people go and give water, at least drink some water. Then the water doesn't have salt and electrolytes and things like that. So what happens is you're nauseous, you're not e eating, and then you are drinking, but mainly some water. So you could have your sodium go down. This is well-known phenomenon with cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide causes low sodium, which is due to SIADH. But this one is not that straightforward like SIADH. I think it is could be easily managed if we pay attention to the patient's oral intake, that it is not just water, there is actually salt and other things. So you may want to take Pedialyte or get Raid or something which has electrolytes in it. So that is also important if the patient is not drinking. Otherwise, as I said, in 48 hours, if the patient is not feeling well, uh, a visit to the doctor's office just to get a liter of saline and then everything is back to well. So I don't think this is a uh, uh, serious uh, 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 side effect. It is more a combination of nausea and how we manage the patient for the nausea. Do patients have to be refractory to other treatments in order to take Selenexor? This phase three trial was one to three lines of therapy. So other than newly diagnosed myeloma patient, Selenexor is accessible to patient even upon first relapse, second relapse, uh, any, any time. Uh, you know, but uh, because, you know, you also know uh, you have Velcade and Kyprolis, then you have Revlimid and Pomelis, then you have a uh, elotuzumab and daratumumab. So you have frontline therapy, second line therapy. So you actually have cocktails, uh, uh, three drug combination in the first line and second line. So the penetrance of Selenexo is uh, less in that area. But, uh, you know, as soon as the second line therapy is done, the third line, this drug is definitely uh, very effective. That's why it was one to three lines of prior therapy. Anybody who had failed one to three lines of therapy. So this could be um, used much more uh, earlier in the case. But what is also important, you know, li like you said, eventually it originally it was approved for relapsed refractory. This drug has shown activity even when the patient has failed CAR T cell therapy. This drug has shown activity even in patient who has failed bispecific antibody. These are drugs which are not, you know, bispecific, not yet approved. CAR T has been approved, but still this drug has shown to be effective even after failure to this drug because it is the first in class, you know, oral drug which inhibits the, you know, nuclear uh, export in, or a nuclear export. So it's a unique mechanism and it is an efficacious drug. So I think that should be kept in mind. I don't know whether you want to use it uh, you know, second line, third line. But this is an effective drug. Don't forget this drug. How does Selenexor affect extramedullary disease? 
Yeah, this drug is is uh, penetrates very well. It has a good penetration. It even gets to the CNS, so extramedullary disease. It penetrates very well, so it is efficacious. If it's going to work, it'll work even in extramedullary disease. You know, people were thinking whether we should do a clinical trial specifically for patients with CNS involvement, but you know that's uh, not so common, and to do a multi-institutional study is not that easy. So it, it has not been specifically geared, study has been done, but this is a drug could be done for extramedullary disease. How is Selenexor taken? Selenexor is an, is an oral drug, comes in 20 milligram tablets. So, you know, you can take uh, four tablets, five tablets. So you are able to titrate the dose very well. Um, the beauty is you are able to take it at home. You get the whole month supply, so you're not going to the infusion center every week to get it. Uh, it depends upon what combination, because most of these drugs are used in combination. It depends upon what combination. You know, if you're getting well kid, you have to go get the well kid in the doctor's office. But if you're uh, getting, you know, pomalidomide, then of course, both of them are oral medication. If you're getting it with the Darzelex, of course, you're getting Darzelex in the doctor's uh, office. So, it is used, you know, the Selenexo can be used like Revlimid or Pomalidomide orally. So that is a good part. And it's very good for uh, elderly patient. It is equally efficacious. Uh, age did not make a difference in the efficacy. As a matter of fact, the, the elder, older patients actually did better on this uh, drug. So the age has not been uh, discriminated in terms of efficacy of this drug. Uh, but, you know, I, I, you know, you got to remember these drugs, we don't use it by itself. It's like uh, cyclophosphamide, we use Cybor D, but if you can get cytoxin by pill, but yet you have to get the bortezomib at the doctor's office. So while, yes, it has an oral medication, it has the advantage you can take it at home. In reality, the combination sometimes has an impact too. So you may still end up going to the doctor's office. So I don't want to overplay that. How often is it taken? It is once a week. It's, that's very important. It is uh, once a week. It could be used twice weekly. Originally, it was approved as twice weekly oral medication, but we know once weekly works very well, especially when it's going to be used in combination. Therefore, the side effects are much uh, more or less, and the patient's abilities to stay on the study. You know, botulism of dex versus, you know, selenex or botulism of dex. Both arms had patients on that. As a matter of fact, more patients were on longer on the bortezomib, selenex, or dex arm, showing that people stayed on this once a week medication because it was more efficacious. So ended up more patients staying on, and the dose adjustment allowed the patient to stay on. So this, you know, unlike what is out there, people say, oh no, no, this has nausea, and people don't stay; they only take it for one month or whatever. In reality, on the clinical trial phase three. Botezomib dex versus botezomib selenex or dex people stayed on the triple arm, triple drug combination very well for a longer period of time. So it was tolerated. So that's a good proof on a large trial uh, to show that uh, the patient tolerated and stayed on the medication for a longer time. Anything else? Expovio. I, I think, uh, you know, it's good to have the information available to patients through portals like you, especially, you know, hearing from another patient or patient friendly focus uh, makes a big difference for patients when they hear it from them. The physicians uh, do talk and, uh, you know, patients say they are experts, sure you know, but uh, they would like to know what is the experience. That's what is called real world evidence. You know, when we talk about real world evidence, you know, the phase three trial is for drug approval. They are run under strict, rigid control, who is eligible, who's not eligible, motivation, people are followed closely, et cetera. The real world evidence is like you, patients taking it and what, how it's been taking, how long patients stay, is it benefited and things like that. And for that, this kind of portal like you have uh, is very, very helpful.